Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session, filling the knowledge gaps on exposure to pollution, a holistic approach with the Human Exposome Network. My name is Anya Sitharam. I'm a former BBC World News presenter and a television health and science correspondent, and I'm really looking forward to moderating this session for the next hour. We're going to be exploring how exposome research can help us understand better our exposure to pollution and also how it might help predict disease risk more accurately. Perhaps the word holistic in the title of this session sums up the potential of exposome science. To talk about the possibilities and answer your questions, we have an expert lineup of speakers. Please go to slido.com, hashtag EU Green Week 2021, and find our room to post your questions. So before we start, let me quickly introduce the speakers today. We have Royal Vermeulen, Professor of Environmental Epidemiology and Exposome Science, and Chair at the European Human Exposome Network. We have Dr. Joanna Lobo Vicente, European Environment Agency. We have Dr. Gary W. Miller from Columbia University in New York. Jacqueline Bowman Busato, EU Policy Lead, European Association for the Study of Obesity and on the Network Advisory Board of the European Human Exposome Network. And we also have Panagiotis Hatsaridis, Policy Advisor at the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patients Associations. And he's also on the Network Advisory Board of EHEN or EHEN. I don't know how it's pronounced. I'm sure we'll find out in a bit. So in 2020, in February, I was privileged to be at the launch of the European Human Exposome Network. And it was launched with a million euro funding from the European Commission. And to tell us more about what it does and also about the science, I'd like to welcome Professor Ruhl Vermeulen. Thank you so much, um, Anya, for the introduction. And on behalf of the European Human Exposome Network, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to this um, webinar for the next hour. My name is Rolf Meulen. I'm a professor at Utrecht University um, and I've been leading for the last 16 months the, the network and I've just um, signed off for that responsibility and Martina Vrijheid, who is now chairing for the next period of time, will actually um, finish off this uh, session later on. If I can get my slides up, uh, please. Ah, great. Um, and unfortunately, my Slido, uh, my clicker disappeared. So I, I hope this um, this is going to work quickly. Um, so I wanted to start with the um, start the the premise that I'm trying to move this forward. Can you move to the next slide because my clicker doesn't yet. So let's start with the, a few details that lay out basically the importance of where we are talking about today. So the first thing that we have to realize is that 90% of the deaths in Europe are from chronic diseases. Secondly, we have to realize that if we look at what are the main causes of these diseases, then genetics only uh, explains a small part of that disease burden. And that actually means that our environment, and when I use the word environment, um, that is in the broad sense that includes nutrition, chemical pollutants, but also social factors, and really we can see um, that that plays an important role. If we move to the next slide, but if we then actually look at how much of that disease burden do we really understand with the science that we have today, then this is really the story of the glasses half full and half empty. We might be able to explain perhaps on the knowledge that we have today about 50% of those causes of the disease but there remains a large part of the disease burden that we actually don't know exactly what these drivers are. And this is really where we, and um, next slide please, we need to focus on. Uh, and that has a lot to do uh, with also the fact that this picture that I show from the global burden of disease um, has um, not incorporated basically also mental health and rare diseases. Now, we also have to understand that next to this enormous disease burden, there's also the fact that our environments around us are very complex. 
Just as a small example, uh, if we look basically at how many chemicals are produced and, and are on the market, then basically that is a staggering number of 140,000 uh, chemicals. Of course, some of those um, are actually so prevalent in our environments that large parts of the human population are exposed to that. We can also see that the chemical production and the rate that new chemicals are coming on the market is increasing. And therefore, if we go to the next slide, we actually can pose as a European um, countries together the question, um, are we doing enough to protect the health of European citizens? Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And on that, that question, uh, basically, um, we would actually, um, well, Chris Wilde in 2005 argued very vigorously that we are not doing enough to actually protect the health of European citizens, that we actually don't understand well enough what are these environmental drivers of disease, that actually by not having that knowledge, we actually cannot have effective prevention programs. Next click. So he came up with a definition, uh, which is here on, on your, your screen, um, which basically said that the um, exposome, as we, we call it, which basically is akin to the Human Genome Project, that we really need to actually have this idea that we are going to measure and quantify the cumulative measure of environmental influences and associated biological responses throughout the lifespan span including exposures from the environment, diet, behavior, and endogenous processes. So really what this means is that we systematically, holistically have to map the environments of the European population to better understand what these health effects are. If we do a few clicks more, um, then we can see that basically that is an all-encompassing um, um, ID that it has a really focus on biological responses. Next click, please. Um, and that it actually covers a wide range of exposures. Please click a few times further to the next slide. There's a few clicks to the next slide. So what we actually are saying here that this exposome concepts tries to do this holistic and systematic understanding of the environmental risks. And that, that starts with actually mapping the environment around us understanding at the system level what happens in the body biologically and taking that to basically the phenotypes uh, that we are looking at. Last year, next slide please, we actually launched the European Human Exposome Network and next click please, we basically after having had the Human Genome Project which delivered us an enormous amount of information about how genetics influence diseases we now have said that 2020 to 2030 really is the decade of exposome research to now, as similar to the genetics, start systematically mapping those environmental factors so that we seriously can start to combat basically chronic diseases. Next slide, please. We're very fortunate that the European Union recognized the importance of actually developing these new methods to systematically map the, the exosome and invested 106 million euros um, for nine projects, which basically are um, displayed here together as the EHAN network. And what are these nine projects doing? Next slide, please. So if we look at what these nine projects are doing, um, they're all developing new tools to map the environments around us. And that actually is the social environment. That is actually the built environment, which includes basically the gray buildup, but also the green areas around us. It basically tries to systematically map also the physical chemical exposures that we are exposed to. Um, but it also basically has um, a focus on basically the social um, surroundings that people are living in or working. By actually developing new methods, we have the ambition to be able to actually produce these kind of insights for the European population. To go to the next slide. But it doesn't stop basically by that system understanding of what we are exposed to. In the end, basically, we have to be able to translate those factors into meaning. And that means that if they have an effect on health, they must have a biological consequence. Luckily, by breakthroughs in many of the biotechnology, uh, we can now actually measure systematically in the human body many molecules that would actually tell us which biological systems are perturbated. 
And again, you can see here that these nine projects are actually tackling many of these layers that are important for our biological system. If we go to the next slide. In the end, of course, um, it is all about disease reduction. In the end, it is about understanding what is driving these chronic diseases, um, which are hugely important for the health and the prosperity of the European population. The projects collectively are studying basically kind of metabolic endpoints, are looking at lung health, are looking at the brain that is both neurodevelopment and neurodegeneration, and are looking at immune diseases but also taking a more holistic approach by actually looking at the complete set of diseases that may, may occur. In the end, if we go to the next slide, um, the purpose of these projects is not to do only science. We come together as a network, we come together actually to develop these new tools, next click please, so that we actually develop a toolbox um, where we actually are able to address these uh, pertinent problems and contribute to the zero pollution uh, policies that we have in Europe. Next class, click, please. Um, we do this uh, not only uh, for the scientific community, uh, but also for the public sector, the private sector, and the urban citizens or the citizens of Europe. We really have to do this collectively together um, and provide for everybody the tools to be actually able to have actionability of this information uh, for the different stakeholders and address these very complex and wicked problems that we have to actually combat the rising um, burden of chronic diseases. In the end, next slide, click please. In the end, it is all about um, this gray matter that is above this picture. More than 50% of the burden, we don't understand exactly what are these drivers. Without that understanding, we will never be able to actually come up with um, effective intervention policies. And so with that, I just wanted to introduce and go to the next slide and say basically that if we think about the uh, ambitions of the European um, community about zero pollution and trying to reduce the burden of diseases of the European population, um, we believe as a network that these novel technologies that we are developing, the idea of bringing this all together at a European large scale will help basically in reaching these ambitions, hopefully um, in the future, where they, we hope in the next 10 years to make a significant um, step in that direction. With that, I would like to hand it over um, to you, uh, Anja. Thank you very much, Raul, for that. And um, I'd now like to uh, hand over to uh, Joanna Loba Vicente from the uh, European Environment Agency to give some thoughts on the new Exposome research. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the possibility of speaking here at the Green Week. And thank you all for your presentation. Um, I do not have a presentation. I'm just going to say a few, a few words about the work um, that the exposome can um, can contribute and how it can link to what we do at the European Environment Agency. So, following on what Ro was saying about the the exposome, uh, the exposome concept uh, is a totality of human environmental exposure over a lifetime combined with gene expression. So we're talking about external exposure and also how it can influence your genes, so a bit of the internal exposure as well. Um, in September, the European Environment Agency launched the Environment and Health Report, and in that report you can see some very interesting maps mentioning the multiple environmental hazards and multiple causes of vulnerability in Europe. We have about 90% of the deaths in Europe that are attributed to the environment in terms of non-communicable diseases. The first one is cancer, the second one is ischemic heart disease, and the third one chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So part of the work that we do at the EEA uh, is the air quality report. So according to the latest EEA data, there's about 400,000 premature deaths per year in Europe due to air pollution. And we must not forget also the health impacts of noise. There's about one in five people that live in areas where noise levels are considered harmful to health. 
And we actually also in that in the noise report, we have some very interesting uh, maps where we overlay the data from air pollution and noise pollution. And we can see the variation of exposure to noise in space is much higher than the variation of air pollution. We also have at the EEA recently launched um, the um, virtual observatory on climate change and health. This is a joint initiative of the European Commission, the Environment Agency and other organizations. So this is a pilot version um, of the observatory at the moment that focuses on existing resources from the various partners. And over time, the, um, the objective is that this observatory will develop new products and add further resources. And obviously climate change impacts and the vulnerability, the direct risks to health, we must remember, are the heat waves that drive excess deaths and how extreme cold can also drive cardiovascular and respiratory disease. The last point I would like to mention that is also linked to the exposome is the exposure to chemicals. So chemical exposure causes about 3% of the global disease burden and the volume and diversity of chemicals consumed in Europe continues to increase. So these impacts of chemicals on health in Europe are still unknown. This is also why at the agency we work with a project on human biomonitoring, so it deals with the internal exposure and it measures the chemical body burden through different exposure pathways. This project is the Human Biomonitoring Initiative in Europe, uh, HBM for you, and we are studying here and making the link between the researchers and the policymakers and understanding how chemical exposure can impact your health our health, everyone's health. <laughs> so this uh, work that we are doing uh, feeds directly into the European Green Deal, um, be it in the chemical strategy for sustainability, the farm to fork, the biodiversity, circular economy, and the most recently uh, released one, the zero pollution strategy. So this is it from my side and a brief presentation of the work that we do that's linked to the exposome. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. That's very interesting. I just wanted to pick up um, that point you made at the end about chemicals um, causing 3% uh, of uh, the disease burden, I think you said. So with this new research that's coming from the exposome science, do you think then we will be able to tell whether chemicals contribute more to disease burden? Well, we, we hope to understand how how this, these contributions are done. And also the ultimate goal is to feed into policy and make sure that we have legislation in place to protect the European citizen's health. So I do hope that the, the results from, from these projects can directly impact the policy making and help to reduce these, this disease burden. Thank you, thank you, Joanna. And we'll be speaking more about um, the impact on policy making in a bit. Um, I just want to go to uh, Dr. Gary Miller now from Columbia University in New York. And uh, Gary, you have been described as one of the pioneers of exposome research. And in, in um, the United States, it's far more advanced than it is in Europe. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was really, would you equate its potential with that of, for instance, the human genome research? I mean, this is something that we all learned way back in school, that we're a combination of our genes and our environment. And we've seen over the last century just extraordinary advances in genomics. And you can easily you know, provide some saliva and get your genome sequenced uh, for a very inexpensive cost. But we don't have the same comprehensive analysis of the environment. And this is what Rule was pointing out, is that this leaves this gap, is that we have a poor understanding of the environmental contributors to human disease. And, and this is why we need these very large comprehensive studies. I like to go back to where we were in the Human Genome Project. When it was started, the technology was not there to do the job. It took investment from industry, from academia, from foundations, and a worldwide collaboration to really advance it. Um, and that's one reason I've really enjoyed my interactions with the European partners, with the HBM for EU, with the Human Exposome Network project is we really need to work together to provide this comprehensive analysis of the environment. 
And like we have genetic linkages to human disease, I believe we will discover many new environmental contributors to human disease. So how can the exposome research be incorporated into environmental science? Well, I mean, I, th I think it's starting to be now is that it's a matter of we we are collecting a lot of information on how these environmental exposures are affecting health. Um, but the key part of it is the integrating it with the other types of data. So we have clinical data about people's health, you know, their their their, their health status. But we also know a lot about where people live and where they work and what the pollution levels are in those areas. Um, one of the challenges, though, about the sort of individual nature is that you can take people that live in the same household and they have very different exposures because they they have different activities. They go to different schools. They have different occupations. So you need this combination of understanding the broader environmental exposures, the green space, the blue space, the pollution, but then coupling that with these measures that we can do in in human blood or urine samples. So you, we need to bring these together to do that. And that can help inform not only health decisions, but also policy. I mean, exposome research has been going on for a bit longer in America, or certainly in a more uh, formal way. Has it actually led to any further understanding or tangible results? So, well, I, I'd actually argue the opposite. I, I believe the European Union is farther ahead than the United States in a systematic uh, approach to the exposome. Um, I think in the US, we've had uh, definitely a high level of interest. And what we're starting to see is these larger comprehensive studies are revealing previously unknown contributors to human disease. And, and part of this is that even simple things where just the technological development is we're identifying breakdown products or metabolites of environmental chemicals that we didn't know existed. And so if you don't even know what those chemicals are, how could you attribute them to a disease? And I think this is one of the basic things we need to think about in, in, in biology is that the chemicals that we're exposed to are usually broken down to some byproduct. And it's more often the byproduct causing the problem than the parent chemical. And so we really need to advance the technology so we can better identify those breakdown products in the body that are more likely to be responsible for making an epigenetic change or altering a pro having a protein modification. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll come back to you in a minute. Absolutely fascinating area of science. Um, do bring in, do contribute your questions, please. We, we will uh, take them shortly. Um, I'd like to go to our next two speakers who both represent patient groups. And first of all, uh, to Jacqueline Bowman Busato. Um, you're the uh, EU policy lead at the European Association of the Study of Obesity. And you're also on the uh, uh, European Human Exposome Network Board. What, what do you hope or what would you like this new research to contribute to the understanding and treatment of obesity? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ramya. In fact, um, I might read that EASO, the European Association for the Study of Obesity, um, is actually um, an association uh, of federations for professionals, uh, ranging from basic researchers all the way through to clinicians, um, and uh, public health professionals and patients. Jacqueline, I think we've lost your sound there. Do you, do you want to just check your mics on? Yep, it's still on for me. Okay, you can carry on. We can hear you now. Okay, thanks. So, um, so to to take up the question directly, um, I think that. Uh, <laughs> It's a really tough one because actually obesity as a chronic disease as categorized very recently by the European Commission um, seems to be the invisible pillar within the Green Deal. Um, over 500,000 deaths are caused, premature deaths are caused within the EU due to untreated obesity. And a big, um, I think a big reason for that, um, and it comes directly to this conversation, 
has been at the heart of it a lack of alignment. So you know, these, you say tomatoes, tomatoes, but uh, within uh, the context of the human ex exposome, um, which goes much wider, as we know, than chemicals. If you actually look at the list of the various elements that make it up, it's exactly the same list that public health professionals use, but with a different language. So when we talk about what do we want this particular piece of research to contribute to policy, um, I would actually take a step back and say that there is an opportunity to firstly align on the language so that it's not only um, one sector or another in terms of uh, research specialization, but that actually those who are interested in, uh, should we say, research agenda policy, as well as those who are interested um, in the uh, policy policies related to implementation of the findings of those uh, research activities, as well as public health interventions, are actually all on the same table. Because so far, what we've seen, certainly in the case of obesity, has been this lack of understanding and even uh, really exploring what is the impact of the various uh, elements of the exposome on the biologies, plural, um, of obesity. And as a result, what we see is, um, quite frankly, failed policies uh, only touching, uh, if that, the surface of um, uh, food policies and you know, the symptoms of obesity, as opposed to really looking at it as a chronic disease that it's been since 1948, according to uh, WHO, ICD, and since 1997, according to WHO, um, as a chronic disease. So I would hope for alignment, um, firstly in the language, Secondly, actually asking the right questions in terms of uh, you know, what is the health outcome that we need to achieve in practical terms? And then how do we actually, um, what is the policy interventions needed uh, in order to facilitate that along the life course from prevention through to uh, treatment and long-term management, just like for other NCDs. And right now, I have to put my hand on heart and say it's we're not there. But we're talking about um, environmental exposures. Yeah, exactly. And you've got a lot of hopes riding on this research. Yeah, and and there's there is so much potential. Um, but actually, if the and this is probably a bit controversial, but what seems to happen is that. Uh, with a lot of research, I'm not just saying it's this area, far from it, um, but with a lot of research areas, everyone creates their own language. So what happens is that within that particular research community, amazing results, absolutely amazing, but then it can't be actually translated into policies at a supranational, national, territorials, or regional levels because the policymakers who need to make those uh, policies, they're not understanding what is what they're being advised because actually they're not speaking the same language in the first place. So that's why I say take a step back, align with at least the language because it won't change the research far from it, but it will actually make that bridge between what is being discussed within the research community and it will actually make it translatable into something that can then be used and taken up by policymakers and championed and understood by you know, people in the street citizens. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go over now um, to um, Pan Panagiotis Haslaridis, and he's from the European Federation of Allergy and Airways. Diseases Patients Associations, welcome. Um, so I would just be interested in your take on exposome research um, and what effect you think that will have on the treatment of uh, patients who suffer from allergies and airways diseases. 
Well, thanks a lot, Anya. Happy, happy to be here uh, with uh, excellent experts and um, uh, other stakeholders. Well, the the work undertaken in the context of the experts on research is crucial because it enhances, as the previous speakers have uh, emphasized, that our understanding of how we uh, interact with the environment and how the environment impacts the risk for disease and our health in general. Well, exactly by complementing the genetic aspects of uh, diseases, Exposome uh, takes a step forward, uh, allowing us to reach more and more specific levels of analysis uh, of our exposures to risk factors pertinent to, to our environment, be it air pollution, climate change, uh, chemicals, uh, tobacco smoke, and so on. Of course, there's a uh, special added value, uh, particularly for diseases such as allergy, asthma, and COPD. Regarding disease burden, there are more than uh, 150 million people living with allergy or asthma in Europe, uh, while COPD is said to become uh, the third biggest cause of death globally if we, if we continue uh, with business as usual. This is why IFA is fully committed to the work of uh, the Human Exposome Network, but also participates in other relevant uh, initiatives, such as the Human Biomonitoring for EU uh, project. The basic problem is that the diseases we represent, all of them, have by definition very complex origins, and their uh, mechanisms have not been fully understood or charted yet. So, uh, uh, even though we can state for sure that there is a very strong link with the environment, and this is uh, scientifically proven. In fact, a large proportion of these patients are uh, underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed or lately diagnosed. So one can only imagine uh, the huge benefits of establishing the links with the environment for their uh, health, well being, and quality of life. Um, therefore, the Exposome project is very well placed to fill those gaps and generate the evidence that uh, that is necessary for regulatory and policy work. And uh, Tifa, we are very glad to, to offer the patient perspective into it. It just needs to be supported by all involved uh, stakeholders, uh, but also equipped with adequate tools to continue its work because there's not a lot more to be done. Thank you for that. Um, just a question to you, just a follow-up question. Um, exposome research is obviously by definition very slow um, and policymakers probably will find it very slow, won't they? I mean, how will they, how will the research keep up with what uh, policymakers want? We do think that uh, the two can be combined and can be uh, put on the same footing. Uh, in this sense, I also think that the exposome can also contribute uh, greatly to the trend towards personalized medicine, uh, which enables a more informed and patient-centered approach that can benefit all people living with chronic diseases. Now, regarding, for example, what you said, the policy, uh, we had recently the uh, zero Pollution Action Plan, um, uh, published uh, recently, which is the main theme of this, the Green Week as well. I would just like to focus on a type of exposure that is very important to everyone, uh, but disproportionately so for people with respiratory condition, and this is uh, indoor air quality. This is a slightly neglected area of uh, pollution that uh, we have not uh, discussed as much as we should um, uh, in the context of uh, air quality in general. Uh, we spend the vast majority of our time indoors, so it is uh, uh, something that we need to take into account uh, that significant pollutants that threaten our health uh, while we are at home or at work exist. And this is uh, uh, something that has ramifications with uh, so many other policies and needs to, uh, to, to, to run uh, to catch up with them. And that means uh, the energy performance of buildings, for example, uh, the volatile organic compounds uh, that are part of the construction products uh, uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, we need to be targeted and we need to be holistic in order to ensure that all aspects of pollution uh, are uh, taken into account and are translated in policy terms um, as such. 
Thank you. So a much more hol holistic approach to policy making uh, with much more evidence. Uh, Jackie Bowman Posato, you wanted to come in briefly there. I, I did because I think that we again we need to realise that um, how can I put this? A, a lot of researchers want to have the perfect answer with all of the outcomes before we say anything. Um, anyone you know, who is uh, not a researcher is more likely to take the best available evidence. And particularly when it comes to policy making, not having uh, the uh, not having the ideal solution um, or you know the ideal set of results is actually an opportunity for policymakers to support the research as well. And I think that we we absolutely need to take that into account because if we're not getting uh, you know, concrete answers or it takes longer it then gives certainly policymakers the opportunity to say, well, what do we need to tweak? What, you know, are we asking the right questions? Is this the correct uh, detail in terms of research prioritization? Should we be um, funding more? You know, and that is a policy in itself to actually decide what to fund. So I, I do think that um, there's plenty of room um, to travel the road together. And it's certainly in the work that we've been doing with the European Commission and Parliament in the context of uh, coordinating the expert secretariat for an interest group on obesity and health systems resilience. And this is actually one of the points that we're working on to make sure that policy can be evidence-based um, as we go through this journey. Okay, thank you. Um, I haven't introduced uh, her yet, but I'm about to. Uh, she was going to do some wrap up thoughts, but I would like to bring uh, her into the discussion. And that's uh, Martine Vrihide, who's the research professor and co leader of the Childhood and Environment Programme at the Institute of Global Health in Barcelona. Uh, welcome. Um, I just wondered what you made of the conversation so far in terms of uh, the impact that this research will have on policy making, whether policymakers should support this research even more, and whether this research in its nature, because it's so complex, is too slow to keep up with policy makers. I think you need to put your mic on. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, no, I was in, in thinking about whether research is too slow or whether expos on research is too slow. Maybe in a way, all research is too slow. We've spent decades just getting policy in place for, for air pollution, for example, or air quality. And it's, it, it's taken a, all these, all these policy, um, uh, you know, research policy translation issues take a long time. But what I think is really clear is that the exposome has the potential um, to make a fundamental shift in how we study environment and health. And we've seen some examples of that already uh, mentioned by the other speakers. And I think there we can we can start to influence policy and and there are some examples that uh, for example gary who who talked about previously unknown um substances chemical compounds that have now you know are, that, are now starting to come out as, as being important for health and disease and and that is one area where obviously we can we can start um getting new findings that may be important for policy and another important example i think is what um jacqueline said about obesity that up to now the focus has been on 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 really just a few risk factors environmental risk factors for obesity and and there is a real need for for uh, studies and for for research that can tackle the complexities of conditions like uh, obesity and it's the same for many other uh, chronic diseases. So yes, this will take time, um, but I think the experts on what it does provide is, is this shift from our, our traditional look at one exposure and one health outcome to a, a much more uh, a systematic approach as, as Rul mentioned earlier and, and the systematic mapping. And, and, and by doing that, we can start giving policymakers um, a much better picture of 
what are we exposed to? How many different exposures are we exposed to? And what are the uh, what are the determinants of those exposures? Who are the, the, the high risk groups? So who, which are the subpopulations that are exposed to many risk factors or environmental exposures, as opposed to you know, the groups that are exposed to many less exposures? And, and those are the sort of questions we can start to, to see from, from the studies already. Um, so so there, will be, there will be a lot of information coming out, I think, in the next few years. Obviously, whether policymakers actually pick that up is, is, and, and do something with it is a, is a, is a different question. Um, but I do, do think there's great potential in the exposome research to, to make that shift to, to providing information on the complexities um, that previously just wasn't there. Um, okay, thank you. Now, we've just had one comment or question that's come in which I want to put to rule the Mullen. Um, I think it was on after something that you had said in your presentation and I, I don't think you actually said it but you did talk about a lot of chemicals coming on stream and someone has uh, Antonio Franco has put in a, in our Slido on what basis do you state that most pesticides are not adequately tested for safety in the EU so actually on that basis, chemicals are tested thoroughly. How, how can um, exposome research change that? What difference would that make? Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I actually didn't say uh, in my slide that pesticides are not um, um, thoroughly tested. Um, of course, we, we, we do have uh, different, different systems in place to guarantee basically um, safety of products. And that's with all chemicals that come on the market um, within the REACH program and other programs that, that is really um, covered. We also have to realize that, of course, there are chemicals in the environment that were there before, basically, the more elaborate testing schemes were, were introduced and they were basically uh, thought in and we still are seeing the consequences of those. And I just have to refer to perforated compounds and others that, that we are seeing the detrimental health effects at this moment. Um, but it's also something else, and that is that, of course, um, although things are tested, um, they are, when they are released into human populations and in real life, um, we expose uh, many, many people and even small effects um, actually may then have a public health consequence. It's also basically the combination that actually might occur in real life that actually has adverse effects to certain subparts of the population. Uh, lastly, uh, where Gary was really pointing towards is one of those that we actually have very little knowledge about, and that is actually degradation products of chemicals that actually happen in the environment. And basically, secondary exposure to these degradation products uh, may have other effects. So I'm not saying that, that things are not adequately done, but there are, it, it leaves room open for still um, health effects to, to occur um, in the open human population. I think the, the, the way that we are trying to actually look at these chemical exposures, look at the uh, degradation products and see how that actually um, relates to health, um, hopefully um, safeguards the European, European population more um, than, than we currently have. Okay, and Joanna, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Uh, yes, I actually, I was thinking uh, uh, the same as the role, I was thinking about the PFAS, these legacy compounds, which uh, have, uh, they persist in the environment for many, many years, and uh, only recently, and when I say recently, maybe in the last five years, I don't mean last month, um, only recently we started investigating more uh, the health effects that these legacy, this, these legacy chemicals have on health in the environment. Um, but I would also like to uh, mention, uh, linking to what Martina was, um, was saying before about this link, how, how are we going to make the link between the researchers and the policymakers? And it's really important to that I think you've touched on a very good point here, which is we have all of these research projects that are producing data and we need to feed this data into the regulators. And I don't just mean the European Commission policymakers, but there are also regulatory entities at national level that should make use of these uh, of these uh, results of these outputs from each project. So it's very important that each project has a link, has a uh, uh, a policy board in their project so that they, the regulatory uptake is adequately done to ensure that the citizens are protected. Thank you. So, Rul, do, do you have any views on um, how these uh, 
uh, exposed zone research could be incorporated into environmental policies? Well, I think a lot has been said about this already uh, by the previous speakers, but I, I just wanted to um, go back to um, something that, that Jacqueline was bringing up, um, and, and that has to do with um, languages uh, and, and basically having a, a common understanding. And I'm, I'm very glad, actually, that in the communication work group of the, the network, we actually have uh, the different stakeholders there as well um, to actually try to speak the same language. Um, it's also very important that in defining the questions, I mean, a, a lot of this has been research driven questions, but all of the projects basically um, are involving um, stakeholders and also citizen groups to, to really see basically, are we addressing um, the right questions? But more importantly, I, I think you have to see what the European Human Expert Home Network is doing as a infrastructural step. We're bringing together um, the health data of many Europeans. We're bringing together um, the exposures of these European citizens um, by using geospatial techniques, by measuring biological samples. And that actually allows us to address many, many different questions, which actually are, are not all addressed within the current research projects. But I think as a collective nine projects, we really believe that we're building an infrastructure that actually can be used to answer other questions. And, and I think this is also an invitation not only to researchers, but also to the different stakeholders and organizations um, to pose the questions to the European Human Exposure Network as things that you think that are really important that, that one should be focusing on. I'm not saying that the research projects can then research that because they are on certain tracks and, and are certain in certain areas, but it allows us basically to see basically what should be the next steps and how can we open up our data to others to answer those questions. And so this is really an open invitation to anybody to actually start that conversation, to actually make a difference in policy. I'd be interested to know what you're doing with all that data you are collecting, with that, with all, all this extra research. I mean, how are you going to coordinate it all? I, I mean, that, that, that is um, something that um, is, is, is really important. And I, I think the European Open Science um, platforms um, are really important here. We see that in all the organization of the European Union, uh, we're moving to basically the um, aspect of uh, fair data, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We have to make that data available. Um, I mean, there are some staggering statistics. That if you look at research projects, uh, about 85% or even more basically is never reused by anybody else to actually ask new questions. And, and this is really that we actually have to pick up collectively to basically build infrastructures in which actually that data actually is made uh, fair. Um, and that's actually been done. If we actually look at the current partnership for chemical risk assessment uh, park, which has been built up, um, a large part of that program actually has um, the infrastructure to make all that data on chemical safety fair. And we should do basically the same on, on the health side. Um, and that's actually where I think the European Union um, can play an important role to actually not only fund research, which is, of course, important, but also fund basically infrastructural support to be able to actually um, keep these resources available to, to um, and all stakeholders in, in the European Union. Joanna, you you you, you um, have just posted it in, in the chat, in our chat, that there is another uh, database for platform for chemicals. Yes, there's the IPCHEM, uh, the Information Platform for Chemicals, which belongs to the European Commission, and it's uh, free of charge, <laughs> you have to register. Uh, obviously, there are rules to submit data to that, everything has to be anonymized, so that, um, um, I can't remember, aggregated data, and, and it covers a whole range of different types of data, human biomonitoring, indoor exposure. So I really invite you to have a look at that platform as well. Uh, the project uh, HBM for you is actually feeding some data into that. And then just to pick up on the, um, the point that uh, on the project, the, the partnership park, the partnership in the assessment of risk in chemicals that is going to be hopefully launched uh, next year. This is a seven year partnership. 
and it involves human biomonitoring and chemical risk assessment. So we will also be covering uh, mixtures and uh, new uh, approach methodologies, methodologies, which you're probably familiar um, recently because the new vaccines are all using that new technology nowadays. So it's very uh, up and coming. And, uh, and the, the Commission is also very much involved in that and are also the EU agencies. In fact, uh, the EEA is uh, the work package co-leader of the science to policy uh, work package. So we really, together with the Austrian Environment Agency, so we really hope that, as Ro was mentioning rightfully so, that the links to research are adequately done and that we do this regulatory uptake to, at EU level and also at national level. And uh, I think there's also something called an EU health data space, um, which J Jacqueline has, has also mentioned. Gary, I'd like to uh, bring you in again. Um, you talked about the very systematic approach uh, of the Europeans on exposome research. Do you hope to learn something new from, from all this wealth of research that's been coordinated? Well, I mean, I think this is what has been very exciting is that the, the exchange of information is critical here. And this is why I happily engage with other partners to learn what they're doing to really advance this. Um, and, I, and I think kind of you know, tying this back to the policy piece is that you know, uh, observers often want to say that science is slow, but it's, it's deliberative and there's a lot of uncertainty. But policymakers have to make decisions. Unfortunately, you can't make a perfect decision with uncertainty. But I do believe this sort of comprehensive analysis can help them make better decisions. And the idea is we have to make sure that there's very good communication between the scientists and the policymakers so that they can make the better decisions. But we have to acknowledge there's always going to be this uncertainty because life is complicated. That's the trouble, though, with science, isn't it? It does lead to more questions and it's not black and white. And how do you explain that to policymakers? But I think a key part of this is, you know, I, at least in the United States, our view is that when we're explaining science to people in Congress, we think about an eighth grade level, like the level that a 12 or 13 year old would understand. Um, and it's it, that's not like to insult them because it can be very smart people. They might be attorneys and other professionals, but it's you do have to boil down these complicated things to things that are easier to interpret to say that this class of chemicals appears to have some very negative consequences. It would be much better if you could shift in this direction. And then hopefully they have some advisors that can help them interpret that. But it's, I, I think this is where we need to have much more interaction with the scientists and the science communication so that they can explain these issues to the policymakers. Um, but the policymakers have to be open to listening to it, right? I mean, this is an important part. They have to be willing to do that. And I think we just have to continue that engagement as more people are elected to positions, you have to restart that communication process. Okay, so let's just take a couple of comments from our two policy leads on, on our discussion panel. First of all, Panagiotis, uh, you wanted to say something and then Jacqueline. Yes, just on this mega issue of integrating science to, uh, to policy making, uh, just a very short comment that for an EU that claims traditionally to have followed a precautionary principle uh, in the past, and uh, for an EU that now has uh, dedicated a large proportion of its uh, next uh, budget, 20% to prevention, I would expect that data uh, are translated into policy as they come out and that uh, nobody really uh, waits until research uh, uh, is uh, uh, finalized or uh, uh, established for good. So I would expect this approach uh, because that would benefit uh, uh, health, which should be a priority for everyone, and that would be benefit well-being and quality of life of Europeans. Okay, so um, we've got about seven minutes before the end. So Jacqueline, very briefly, and then I'll bring Joanna, and then Martine's going to, to wrap it all up. Okay, 26 years in policy. My job is to bridge the gap between the science, the scientists, and the policymakers. Policymakers have offices that, and who are not scientists either. So we cannot expect a scientist 
that the Capine staff will miraculously understand something that their bosses don't. Our job is to make sure that it's not about simplicity, because look where that got us on obesity for, over, for decades. It's about precision and accuracy, something that they will absolutely appreciate with some stats to back up. Yes, you can say uncertainty, but give the message. Politicians, public administrators are open to listening. We don't need to dress it up. We just need to work with them and together to find a solution. And the final point is that these days, and particularly coming from the European Commission and uh, all international organizations, it's now about health outcomes. It's no longer about silo thinking, pathology, pathology. It's the health outcome. And that's why the human exposome in all of its elements, it's our time. Okay, great. And very quickly, Joanna, before Martine comes in. Very quickly to, to just pick up on the point that Pano Yotis was uh, mentioning earlier about not waiting for the publications to be out for the regulatory um, agencies and institutions to do something with it. Uh, in fact, that, that's a very important point that we have discussed in the human biomonitoring project, and I hope it carries on into the park, which is that uh, we communicate the results directly to the policymakers and they know of them. But as you know, also this, this lawmaking process takes some time, but they do have access to this data. They keep it confidential and they and that this also allows the scientists to then publish their publications and, uh, and the policymakers to carry on in parallel with their work with this data. Okay, thank you. Well, that's been a really uh, interesting discussion. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Martine for some final thoughts. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's hard to summarize all of this, but um, as a wrap up, I would say that the new network, so the, the, the human, uh, the European human uh, exposome network, I, I think we have to, you know, summar summarize carefully what we're going to be, ex what we can expect from this type of network in the, in the coming years, because this is obviously a four or five year um, effort. Um, and I would say that there's, we're going to see major um, contributions in, in three main areas. So there's three pillars to this. Yeah? First of all, this network will bring um, data and tools. So this is really to do with the infrastructure that, that Rul talked about, and it will really make use of the latest technologies, for example, the technologies that Gary explained to us. So this is data and tool uh, building. So what we will have for the first time is large projects with large databases that actually put together data on multiple exposures data on internal responses and and the diseases and this is you know a, a really really important step forward to what we had before which is very scattered databases which don't allow exposome research the second pillar is the research the researchers will do their research and they will basically give us the the evidence uh, that is in these databases to to link all these exposures the multiple exposures the mixtures the unknown exposures to the disease endpoints so that's the second part we can expect we can expect a lot of new evidence from these nine projects uh, in the different disease areas that that Rol indicated in his first uh, talk um again going a step further to what we've has had up to now which is one one exposure one disease these projects will bring much more evidence on the complexities in that and then finally and this is where we've had a lot of discussion this is the the translation pillar and and how are we going to translate all of this to policymakers, to citizens to other stakeholders and um you know, actually explain the tools and the databases, make make things openly available. And I mean, there is a lot of work going into this. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I think with, with the input that you've provided today and the people we have um, working with us in, in the separate projects and also in the network, I think we can, we can make some major advances there and and everything that's been said today is really important language translation um communication 
bringing people around the table. Um, I don't. I think those are the, the really important points that have been made today. Okay. Um, we're going to have to wrap up uh, soon. Uh, I just want to hand over to Raul just for 20 seconds to give a plug to a conference coming up next week. But before I do that, um, I just want to thank all the speakers and also the technical crew uh, for keeping this afloat and also to you, the audience. Raul, over to you for 20 seconds. Thank you so much. Uh, I will be very uh, quick also to thank everybody uh, here in, in the panel discussion. Um, we'll continue this discussion actually in the partner events of Green Week next week, um, there will be a policy workshop uh, where we continue to debate basically how to translate exposome research into policy. Um, I would encourage you to basically go to the EN website and, and register for that partner event. On the 11th of June, actually, the European Human Exposome Network is presenting their, their first results um, of the first year. And I'm encouraging everybody also to um, tune into that. It's all free. Um, so please um, come and um, give your ideas also to us. I mean, this is a two way street. Um, so again, this is an open invitation uh, to really participate. And on, on that, uh, thank you very much for watching, everyone, and perhaps see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you.